As a major research institution, Arizona State University offers the most online bachelor's degree programs, along with world-class faculty and dedicated support. Discover why ASU is ranked number one in innovation for nine consecutive years. Tap to learn more. How about Captain Crunch's Crunch Berries with breakfast? Whoa, Dad, we're on Crunch Island. <gasps> it's Jean Le Foot. <laughs> Stole our crunch! Quick, the zip line! He's getting away! Throw our last crunch berry! No! No one steals my crunch berries! I think you mean my crunch berries. Choose your own crunch venture with Captain Crunch! Raider DeAndre here with Alistair Weaver. How you doing? I'm good, Matt. Thank you very much. Uh, some exciting things. You had a you had a fun event that you went to recently and uh, driving uh, more vehicles. Uh, the events are always fun. We've done so many press events and launch events and and they're usually good. Some are over the top. Some are like when we talked a couple of weeks ago about the Hyundai, the Ionic five and some of them are elaborate driving events on the track and they're, they're fun. And then just, some are just, just so much glam and, and just uh, showing off, I guess, in a sense. Um, and then, you know, there's been some that we've gone to are like, it's just a warehouse with a car with a light on it. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like dim the lights, turn on the spotlight. Here's the car. Uh, but they're always kind of interesting to to check them out. So I want to get into that as well, the event that you went into. Before we get started, let's talk a little bit about Bet Online. Bet Online is your number one source for all your summer sports this season, from MLB to golf, NBA, and NHL playoffs. You can get all the latest stats, news, and scores available for your favorite teams. You can get the latest odds and lines, including team matchups, player props, and odds on just about every sport out there. Just head to the website or use your mobile device to get in on the action. It's Bet Online, where the game starts. Sorry, I'm getting alerts on my computer in the middle of my ad reads, throwing me off. Uh, all right, so the event you went to, uh, <clears throat> tell us about it. Yeah, so this was kind of fun because most, you're right, a lot of what we go to is media specific event so it's the usual crowd of you know sort of people standing around talking about talking about the industry but this was actually a customer event for mclaren which is really interesting because you get a proper sense of like who's actually buying these cars and i've been to a couple now and the first one we went to was the speed tail which if memory serves was like a couple of million bucks wasn't it, it was a fortune and what was fun about that event is they both of them were held in it's often the stuff that's for sale or people basically renting out their crazy homes in the Hollywood Hills. So last night's was a $40 million home. I think the speed tail was, was similar, but for the speed tail, it was like media coming in the afternoon and then cost these things 2 million and the real high rollers are coming in media. Could you please leave now? I.e., get out because rich celebrities are arriving. And we don't want you here, but the Arturo, which is, you know, quarter of a million, not 2 million. Like they were happy for us to hang around, which is always entertaining because you get to see, you know, what everybody shows up in. People show up in Ferraris, in Rolls Royce, a lot of 911s, Lotuses as well. And then there was just a, it was basically just a cocktail party. So awesome people watching all sorts of leisure wear on display, as you can imagine. I did. So I wasn't at the speed tail one. You mentioned that before, but what was the Roadster, the limited edition like Roadster? And it had that little wing that pops up in the front. Um, I forgot the name of that car, but I went to that one with mclaren and that was also at like you know this was a few years ago so the house was only like 35 million dollars <laughs> uh and and yeah and in the lobby whoever owned the house had um like a dinosaur skeleton skeleton oh like a, i think like... it's the same one i think it's not the speed tail i think you're right and i can't even remember the name of the car which is terrible but it was the same thing remember like we were all shoot away before like the, yeah. the real high rollers came in yeah they I were like, hey. yeah i remember now yeah, They're like look around at the house, see whatever you want. Just take your shoes off because we have real people coming in later. And I was like, yes. oh, OK. <laughs> yeah. so, so last night we could actually stick. We could actually stick around, um, you know, even vague because I think our tour customers are still obviously very wealthy, but perhaps aren't quite as famous and quite as wealthy because they're not spending two million bucks on a on a car. So this was a house. I'm going to talk about the house first. Actually, I think that's probably the more <laughs> just as interesting, <laughs> if not more interesting than the car. 
So apparently this was owned by a diamond billionaire. And it is almost like my fr friend Alana Show is there. I hope she won't mind me showing what she Alana's said. She said he's Pam? I, Alana's Alana. the best, by the way. I love her. Alana's awesome. Yeah, and she fantastic. said, this is the house that sort of naughty boys would draw if they were just given like endless, <laughs> endless, endless cash. It, and, it, and it absolutely felt like that. Matt's showing, if you're watching on YouTube, Matt's showing a couple of images, but there was literally a live mermaid, i.e. somebody dressed in a mermaid suit in the pool. <laughs> no, <laughs> nobody, nobody explained why, but there was a mermaid in the pool and it had this kind of infinity pool overlooking LA. Yeah. And then in the sort of downstairs lounge, I suppose you could call it, it had a glass box, which they'd put the Arturo in. And I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. I wonder how they got the car in there. And then you realize that actually when the house was designed, this is all part of the showcase. So you drive into the into where the garage is at the top of the house in the Hollywood Hills, and then you go down a car elevator, and then your car is basically a piece of art in your living room in its own little glass box. Yeah. Which again, like if you have endless money and you're just sort of thinking, what is like my bachelor pad looking like? That's what you'd have. And then there was, there was a wall full of like Playboy covers. And it was, it, it, it was extraordinary. It's an extraordinary place. Really unhomely, really kind of like, where would you just kick your shoes off and like watch the, you know, watch the soccer on your, on your TV or watch the Grand Prix or something. And also no privacy. So you got two like pools. Yeah. $45 million, but people can still look in. $45 million. I want to kind of bathe naked in my own pool if I want to. You know, one of, uh, pool, but... uh, one of Adam Krola's houses long ago um, in LA, uh, an older kind of Spanish style home, I would say. And um, yeah, on the top of a hill. And it had a gate around it and there was a pool and then he built like a bar under the pool. So when you go into this like speakeasy bar with no windows, the only windows were like three portholes that looked into the pool from the back of the bar. Uh, but the it didn't really have much of a garage. So on the back side of the house, um, because it was sort of two levels, where you drive in through the gate would be the garage level. And then the house is kind of above it. So he built this big garage down there um, with like barn door style. It's really, really cool. And then in the garage, there was a lift. There was a flush single post lift. And it would, the lift would go up. It would basically grab a piece of the ceiling and bring it down. And then there was ramps. So you can drive a car onto it. And when it pushes it back up, the car was in his office that he built above it. So, and he, and at the time he had his Lamborghini Miura in there. And it's, although the house had sort of this older style to it, he made the office, which kind of hung off the edge of the house as, as clean and modern as possible, just all butt joint glass. And his desk was like, clear plexiglass so and it was just a car sort of floating there overlooking like all of of, of la uh but it was it was a it was a complex feat to get the car in there because the lift isn't isn't tall enough right because if you just go and buy like a you know the mechanics behind a a, a flush mount like hydraulic lift or anything it yes. never really can get high enough so when it lowers the roof there was sort of these cables and pulley system to to bring down this chunk of of ceiling and and flooring above it you know for the cool. second level and you got to load the car up there and it worked he he designed it basically built it and put it in there and it was it was it was cool but uh it was it was complex it's it's as a it's, matter of fact we had tanner faust come over and take a look at it and he loved it so much that down in his newport house he built one he has in his house, he, he he drives into his garage and it pushes his car up into this like glass room where he has like his driving suits and helmets and his memorabilia. So apparently, all the rich guys are doing this now. It's like <laughs> a it's like a look at me. It's a look at me room. Yeah, it really it's kind a, of it's, is. It's, it's, it's a it's a it's the modern MySpace. It's a new way to do a trophy room and just have it with a car in there. So it's, it's um yeah it was it was it was. It's extraordinary. And it's also kind of like where 
you know, these events cost a lot of money and it makes you realize just how the, the market for super sports cars is small. And this is why everybody's getting into SUVs, why Lamborghini has the Urus and that's its biggest seller. Ferrari's doing the Purisang. And McLaren is just sort of persisting. And, you know, historically, the CEO who went on about it for years saying we're never going to do an SUV is gone. And they're looking for a technical partnership. And I'm sure they will do something of that ilk. You know, they'll probably won't call it an SUV, but it will be a, yeah. you know, more Lotus versatile is doing car. It now. I mean, everybody's doing it. Yeah. It's because, you know, the market is tiny for, you know, super sports cars that are, you know, north of, you know, 250, 300 grand. Even even in a place like LA or Miami or the Middle East, so McLaren's doing, you know, about three thousand cars a year. Three this year they'll do three to four thousand cars probably. If you look at Lamborghini, the actual sports car sales not dissimilar. You know, no, there just isn't a big market, so you've got to diversify and you've got to do other stuff. And I think it's well known that McLaren's had a really tough time for. The last two or three years in particular, they've lost a ton of money. They've had a effectively a management buy, buyout, so it's now owned by the Bahrainis. So they're in a better place, and they like consolidated everything. But it's it's a tough business, and you realize just like the money that goes into just kind of trying to woo the customer at that that level of the market as well. I mean, you know, you've got to lay on all the food, you've got to hire the place, you've got to run all the valet and the champagne, and God yeah. knows what else that goes with it. Yeah, but you think about like with McLaren, like who would be a good technical partner, especially on developing something like a like a hot SUV? I mean, Aston Martin's got one now, like we were saying. Lotus has their electric version, their SUV. Ferrari's coming out with theirs. Lamborghini has theirs. Uh, and some of the, the bigger companies, you know, like a Porsche, Audi, VW, they can obviously share platforms all internally and, and get you the different variations of, of from a mild to a completely wild SUV. I'm not sure who would be a good partner with, with McLaren. Cause I, I don't mean, know that they're really working with anybody anyway. Are they working I think with anybody working on the, the racing side? They're working on a technical partnership. And a part of the problem is electrification. So the Atura is a plug-in hybrid. I think it does like 11 miles on a, on a charge. So that is really expensive, really complicated technology. A, to get right and work well, but then be reliable and everything else. And yeah, there are lots of, I mean, Ricardo built McLaren's engine originally and everything else. So, you know, there's a lot of kind of like partners that you can work with. But the easy, you know, the best way to do it is similar to what Aston's been trying to do with AMG is buy the engine or the hybrid system from somebody else, get your infotainment and your air conditioning and all the stuff that you don't see from somebody else because it's really expensive. Yeah. And then basically make something that looks super pretty, super exclusive, you know, super kind of bespoke and away you go. And then it all becomes about the brand and the experience and, and everything else. So that's what, that's what probably they need going forward. Cause it's just, you know, how do you pay for a vehicle? Because if you're Lamborghini, then as you say, you've got all the Volkswagen group behind you. So the Urus shares a lot of parts with the Bentayga, with the Cayenne, et cetera. You know, if Ferrari is a bit of a unicorn in that their profit margins are so high and the brand's so strong. And then, you know, every, everybody else is trying to build some sort of partnership. So McLaren really needs that if it's, you know, in the future, if it's going to compete and get itself back into back into profit. And, you know, reliability becomes critical and everything else. But they've always, they always look cool, but they are, you do look around. I took a friend with me who, he owns a Cayman, so he's a bit of a car guy, but not a. He's a tech guy, really. He's not. He's not sort of a, a geek like you and I. So, you know, he looked around and he's like, "So that's a six fifty, and that's six. That's new, and that's three hundred and fifty grand plus. That's the Atura that's two hundred and fifty grand. But the one at two hundred and fifty grand actually looks kind of more modern and cooler than the six fifty, or more fresh. Or they basically look so similar." That how do you justify that over that? And and that, it's true. It's just like there's very yeah. little differentiation now. They're all just, it's like, let's build a bunch, bunch of mid-engine supercars and pepper the market, but it's tricky. Yeah, I'm curious to see who are they able to link up with on developing, on, on sharing some technology, sharing some platform. And 
I, I like the idea of this, of the hybrid supercar using hybrid technology for performance. I always thought was, was good. It was super smart, but, but it does still kind of bring up the, the car, like, are you buying the car to drive or are you buying the car to, you know, drive 500 miles a year and mostly collect? I don't think these EVs and, and hybrid supercars are going to sit well, literally sit well, if you're driving at 500 miles a year. I think they need we, to be We've driven. talked about this before, haven't we, with the problems with the, with the LaFerrari and, I mean, yeah. the, hopefully the Artura is, if you look at the market, you've basically got your 911, then you've got your 911 Turbo, and things like the Artura sit sort of just on top of the 911 Turbo. So the clientele they're trying to seduce is people who look around and say, everybody's got a 911. I need something different. I want something that looks a lot more exotic. And it definitely looks a lot more exotic than a than a 911. So that's kind of where the market is. So it's sort of, it's not like mega money. It's, it's mega money to you and I, but it, it's that sort of, well, I'm just trying to creep out of a 911 turbo or something. So I'm going to spend, you know, a quarter of a million or something like that on one of these. Yeah, and then, the 911 turbo in, in LA, at least, that's a car that can get driven every day and often does like there are yes. people that have them. Like I just, I just drive my 911 turbo every day. Maybe their commute's only three, four miles a day, but I like, it doesn't matter where you are for some reason in LA compared to all these other cars. You can go to like any, like, I, you know, I was just in a grocery store. I was in a pavilions parking lot and there was a 911 turbo S just sitting out front, the CVS. <laughs> yeah, because that was always the point in the 911 Turbo, wasn't it? It's was the everyday hypercar, yeah. everyday supercar. And then the Atura, I mean, a similar thing. You could you could use it every day, but you most likely don't. Right. Um, and then what happens in the long term to these batteries and stuff that sit? Like we we know like McLaren P1, La Ferrari, it's like it's not the ideal situation. Yeah. <laughs> uh but I uh, hope I like I have a lot of I mean not just because they you know I suppose they're Bahraini now in a way but you know not just because the thing I, I have a bit of a soft spot for McLaren it's a really tough gig. Years ago I was remember I was being approached by a hedge fund who want talking about whether they were going to invest when they originally set it up back in the kind of Ron Dennis days and McLaren Automotive and always felt like a tough ass to build another supercar brand even with the heritage that McLaren had out from the F1 but. We'll see. I mean, you know, F1 racing's got big over here. McLaren's now, you know, won the last Grand Prix. Maybe that will give them a little bit of a halo effect. I'm just not sure how many people last night associate McLaren Formula One. Lando Norris has just won. Oh, therefore, that this is a supercar and that's related to the Formula One. I just don't know how many yeah. people really make that. I or mean, Senna or, you know, all the heritage of McLaren as a, as a motorsport company. They're trying to do it with with IndyCar as well. I mean, they've got yeah they they they've got the the biggest budget. They're spending more than any other IndyCar team. I don't think last season they won a single race, and uh, and they've got some fantastic drivers on on the team now, and uh, and they're they're paying them. You know, Paddle Awards getting you know finally is his an IndyCar driver's salary is public, which is interesting because it it moves the needle like it 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 draws attention to the sport what's he getting uh, paid i didn't know i forgot what it was i think it was like four million wow it's yeah a change isn't it yeah uh and i don't re recall exactly if if it was like a two-year deal or whatever it was but yeah but yes and other indy car drivers like you know like graham ray hall who's 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 great i like graham a lot you know, the announcement came out and everyone's like, hey, he's probably not the highest paid one still at this mm. point. Maybe like Baloo Scott Dixon, something, yeah. uh, you know, Scott Dixon, who's who's a veteran, uh, is probably getting paid more. But nobody ever knew what the amounts were. And now that Pato's salary was public, Graham was like, congratulations. Next time you're buying lunch, next time we hang out, it's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, he's like the rest of us aren't quite there yet, <laughs> you know. Um, right. But but you know McLaren, uh, if you guys are watching this hundred days to Indy, the um the the show kind of this reality show leading up to Indy, they did a season last year. It was interesting, and you get kind of a deep dive into who the drivers are and what's happening at the races, and it's interesting because they also follow the races, and so you get sort of a behind the scenes look of what happened 
you know, if you went to Long Beach Grand Prix and you saw it, it's great. And then now you can watch a show and go back and go, oh, this is kind of what happened kind of behind the scenes at the Grand Prix in, uh, of Long Beach. And uh, and yeah, they're everyone out in there is going, McLaren's got the biggest budget. They're spending the most amount of money. All eyes are on them, but they haven't won a race like in a year. So they've they've got a lot to prove at this point. It it's uh, I was going to go to the 500 this year, but then I I can't have friends coming to town, so I couldn't couldn't go. But maybe next year it's on the it's on the bucket list. And but I'm still not convinced. Like it, McLaren wins the Indy 500. I just this is always you know the whole win on a Sunday, sell on a Monday. I'm just not yeah. convinced that people, you know, Pato Award wins the Indy 500. Next day somebody goes, I've got to buy an Atura. I'm just not sure that that. Right. Also, because it's powered by like Honda, I think, and I'm not exactly sure if they're running the Honda engine or not. But there's yeah. only two engines, and none of them are McLaren. So, uh, yeah. there's there's a, a little bit. And even bit... the McLaren engine isn't really McLaren. And it wasn't really <laughs> built by you know. It wasn't. But anyway, it's all it's all fun. Should we talk about a real car, a truck? Yeah, let's talk about a real car. <laughs> well, we uh, are about to drive the Atura. We've driven the Atura Coupe, and then we're about to drive the Spider. Not me personally, because I couldn't justify going to the south of France to drive it. But it's um, it's uh, yeah, it's a cool, it's a cool thing, and I love the fantasy element of it. You know, it's a proper old school, you know, stick it on your bedroom wall supercar, and I, you know, it's yeah. still cool. Yeah, it is cool. I can't wait to drive it. Honestly, of like you were saying, of all the cars, seven twenty S is still one of my all time favorite cars to drive. Love that car. It is love so good. It's just so fantastic. Uh, someday when prices drop and they're $37,000 yeah. on bring a trailer or something, then I'm all over it. Yes. <laughs> How about Captain Crunch's crunch berries with breakfast? Whoa, well, dad, we're on Crunch Island. <gasps> it's Jean Le Foot. <laughs> and he stole our crunch. Quick, the zip line. He's getting away. Throw our last crunch berry. No. No one steals my crunch berries. I think you mean my crunch berries. Choose your own crunch venture with Tapping Crunch. At Mayo Clinic in Florida, we're predicting the unpredictable. Using 3D printed life-size organ models to map out complex surgeries ahead of time. Learn more at mayoclinic.org slash possible. Mayo Clinic, you know where to go. When it comes to teaching kids and teens about money, practice makes perfect. That's where Greenlight comes in. With a debit card and money app of their own, kids learn to earn, save, spend wisely, and invest. Parents send instant money transfers, create custom chores, and automate allowance, while kids track their spending, set savings goals, and practice money skills they can use today and for life. Get one month free when you sign up at greenlight.com slash podcast. They say plants like music. Yeah, no, like really, they, they respond to the vibrations of it, which means that this playlist you're listening to, the plants are too. You know what else plants like? Organic soil from miracle Grow. It's made with all the best stuff like wood fiber and compost. Plus, it's OMRI certified organic, which officially means it's made with superior ingredients. And when you give your plants the stuff that makes them happy, they won't judge you on your iffy playlist. Hear that, plants? So go ahead and give them miracle Grow. There. All right. Uh, Ford Ranger. What are you driving right now? You're driving the Ranger Raptor? Ranger Raptor. So we yeah. talked a little bit about the Ranger and the Tacoma and the Colorado on recent recent weeks, but finally got pause on the Ranger Raptor this week. And absolutely love it. I I was the only person turning up at the McLaren party in a truck yesterday, which also pleased me. <laughs> um, pulled in beside a, a 911 and a Rolls Royce. Um, it's cool. You know, twin turbo V6, 400 horsepower. And what I really like, I mean, you know, you and I spent time in the the F-150 Raptor and it's just yeah. massive, isn't it? Everything about it is over the top to the point where even outside of a, you know, metropolitan area like LA, it still just feels a lot of vehicle. What I love about this little Ranger is it's just so much more nimble and agile just by the fact that it isn't so, you know, ridiculously big. 400 horsepower it's super you know it feels fast it's very i haven't taken it off road yet but just driving it around the driving it around on the road it's comfortable it's capable and it just has that kind of spirit about it. the interior it's you know like all these trucks they're all a 
bit, if we're honest about it, a bit naff, aren't they? They're a bit naff. But it's just, it's kind of naff in quite a cool way. So, like, you've got all, like, the orange uh, orange around the, the air vents. You've got... Yeah. A very kind of aggressive steering wheel. You've got like these orange inserts and Alcantara on the seats. It's it's fun. It's like it's self consciously fun, and I think it's what it's sixty grand just thereabouts, and it's clearly not cheap, but it's a lot of vehicle, and I'd re- I'd love one. I think it's cool. I I I agree. I went to a launch of this thing. Um, it seems like a while ago. Maybe it was like a year ago now. And then there's a delay on all of the Rangers, and we didn't get a chance to drive them at the event. But they had it there. It was all about the new Ranger, and they had the Ranger Raptor there. And then going, you know, like you said, driving the F one fifty Raptor, and then driving the Bronco Raptor. And you look at this and go, where does this fit in? And the Ranger Raptor to me is kind of the sweet spot for for all of it. You know, I mean, certainly you can go crazy with a with a Ranger or with a Raptor R with the big power. The Bronco is great. I like the Bronco a lot, but not everybody's going to either want the soft top version or the removable hard top. Because let's face it, the removable hard top being kind of plastic, it still is quite a bit of noise. Um, you know maybe that's not quite what you're looking for. If you're looking for something a little bit more solid all around and the Ranger Raptor kind of fits the bill. It's got some really interesting features that I think they've learned from both the F-150 and the Bronco, um, how they're tuning and refining the suspension. What parts of the vehicle that they discover need to be beefed up sections of the frame control arms, suspension pieces. The Ranger Raptor has a Watts link in the rear end as opposed to just the uh, like uh, the, the live axle um, and either on coils or or just a leaf or whatever's going yeah, it's on. Yeah, it's coils. Yeah, it's coil over at the back. Yeah. yeah. And then. Uh, yeah, some pretty cool, pretty cool stuff going on there. And also the, the bit of fun with like you can have Baja mode and stuff so you can like have the exhaust. The exhaust got like four different settings from, you know, quiet to which is kind of useful if you live you know have neighbors that you quite like through to baja which is a bit like the gt500 you're only supposed to use it on a track or off road but of course you know you put that on as the default and yeah it's um it's a cool thing and then you can you know have it as bright or as demure as you wish the one i've got is black and i think that's kind of cool it's a little bit it's a little bit stealthy and i agree with you like the bronco raptor it's got those big like big flares on the wheel arches and it's just big and wide and the wrap this this ranger just feels you say it's a bit of a sweet spot it's just it's not too ostentatious it's not too big you can kind of tune it up and down it's 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 just a really it's a really fun thing i'd have one in a heartbeat now you're 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 cruising around from the office to manhattan beach and whatnot how is it just on the road how is it It, it's good those fox shocks are pretty sophisticated they work they work really well on the um you know they they work really well um so it's not, it's not, un, it's not uncomfortable. Um, that ten-speed auto is fantastic. You know, any so it's it's very usable as an everyday car, even or an everyday truck, even if you don't go off road. You know, and like the family like it. You know, the kids were very excited. And it's it's just got like a bit of spirit about it. And you know, these days that's kind of what I want to want a car to have. I mean, I like the Ranger full stop, but the Raptor's like, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, it is cool. And like you said, it's about 57,000 bucks, just under, you know, quite, you know, under 60,000. I don't know if there's a lot of options on the Raptor. No, that's it. That's what's quite nice about it. I mean, actually, that's pretty much it. You can play around with a bit, but that's not, yeah, you don't have to go and spend another 20 or something. So, yeah, and it's just, it's just a good size. It's a good size. Yeah, that's the other thing is, especially like around town or in, in, in the city here is, you know, I, I I drive a full size F one fifty, and I I got used to it, but there are some limitations to it for sure. I yeah. always have and to the, think about where am I going to park this thing. And then the Raptor is obviously like the the sheer width of a Raptor is is nuts. So, yeah. and then and then also just the agility; it's always just a big heavy lump. So, no big fan of the Ranger. It's a good thing, and we're yeah, looking I, forward actually. The Tacoma TRD Pro will line up against that. So. You know, that's, that's already pretty hybrid. expensive because you can get a fully loaded Tacoma at over 60,000 bucks before yeah. you even dress it up to TRD Pro. So 
It'll be interesting to see. Although that's supposed to have the funky seats, right? Like the the one, yeah, the funky the seats, seats that does those little shock absorbers that basically support your back when you're off road, but also rob the rear passengers of any legroom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I don't mind that though. I I just kind of feel like there's that's enough. Good variations of the Tacoma that you kind of pick what you want. Are you going to yeah. use the back a lot? Do you have kids, you have a family or whatever, and you're going to use it for that. There's an off-road version you can get. doesn't have fancy shock absorber seats, yeah. but if it's just, you know, you and a friend or something, and it's just going out on the weekends quite often, just off-roading or something like that, or meeting up with a bunch of pals out there, uh, you know, you're probably not using the back seat as much for people, maybe for gear. Yeah. Um, real quick before we wrap up, let's go in a little bit different direction here. Let's talk about the the Mercedes Maybach because you know <laughs> Ranger and <laughs> Ranger Raptor and Maybach. <laughs> yeah, just to be clear, Edmonds is about like you know sensible everyday cars. This week, this this week, show we actually have a very I'm going to we have a very yeah. nice video just come out on um, hybrid uh, small SUV hybrids, which Brian Wong presented. So that's um, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, that's well worth a watch, Rav Four and uh, and uh, Honda and Sportish. But yes, we also had a Maybach, and we you know we 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 cover the we cover the extremities, <laughs> and it was the V12, and I can't remember the last time I drove like a V12 Maybach S680. So this is sort of a rival to you know the Bentley Flying Spur. It's kind of sub Rolls Royce, and what's kind of nice about it is it's especially if you you know spec it right you can actually tune it down a little bit so it doesn't look quite so ostentatious and there are bits in it where you realize that it's a glorified s-class some of the trim and things like that isn't as good as a bentley it's still like some of the plastics and doesn't feel quite as handcrafted as a bentley but it's yeah, a nice ask, way to when travel. you look into that high-end market of rolls royce bentley and maybach like maybach wasn't always kind of in the conversation but it it's still trying to be in the conversation. It was standalone. And then Mercedes brought it kind of back and called it the Mercedes Maybach instead of just the Maybach. And I think what they realized was doing genuine standalone models was just too expensive. So you're better off doing a super high-end S-Class where you style it a bit different and then call it. Yeah, I mean, Maybach was the 1930s. Again, German history in the 1930s wasn't great. Um, you know, it comes from a pretty terrible era and some of the early owners were, were far from um, some of history's nastiest characters. But, you know, they brought it, they brought this brand back as a basically recognizing that Mercedes, because it spans all the way from the, you know, GLA over here, that people needed to have something different when they were getting up to 200 grand. So they, you know, this was the whole genesis of my back. And the idea originally was we're going to have it as a, as a standalone brand. And that didn't really work with the 62S and the 57. It was just too, ex they were too expensive, too expensive to produce. And then the technology felt a bit dated. So what they basically done now is say, let's take the S class. Let's take the, you know, GLS, uh, especially the um, EQ, EQS SUV and just, just tart them up for one of a better expression. Let's have better leather, better interiors. The S class has got a longer wheelbase. It's got these like, business class style seats in the back and i think where they work is people who don't want the ostentation of a bentley or, or particularly a rolls royce they just want something super nice to be driven around in or to drive around which flies a little bit more under the radar i think you can turn up in a my back and it you know not you're not making that instant statement that you know here here is a you know pretty, honestly uh, you wouldn't you, you wouldn't notice at first glance from the outside that it was something really different other than the wild two-tone paint jobs that they're putting. Yeah. On. And so you can just them. have it in black if you want to really down yeah. tune If you it. just so, got it all black and be like, Oh, it's a, that's a really nice yeah. Mercedes, another nice Mercedes. And then of course, when you get into the interior, you kind of see what the difference is, but uh, from the outside without, without the, the two-tone paint that they keep showing, you know, on all of all of their cars, like you wouldn't really notice right away. Yeah, so it was just a nice thing. I mean, it's a V12, and I haven't driven a V12 in so long. So I think it did. We had it down on the test track. I think it did zero to 60 in like four seconds or something. Um, and you can sit in the back, and there's a fridge, and you can, you know, they have these little sh silver champagne flutes, which uh, have their own little holders to keep your yeah. champagne stable at speed. And it's a nice way to travel. Now, it's a nice way to travel. It, it, 
if, like a month or so ago, you were driving the Rolls Royce Spectre. Yeah, there was EV. Yeah, the EV version. Now, do you, I mean it's not the same car. One's a big coupe, and what you're talking about is you know big sedan, and Maybach has an SUV. Uh, but the Rolls was twice as much money. The Rolls was like yeah. Half I was gonna million. say like how what what's I think the problem with those the, are Rolls, the right? Rolls Royce just you turn up in a Rolls and you're just telling the world that I'm mega rich and I don't care who knows it. Yeah. It's just I felt like I felt just a bit awkward, you know, driving it. Especially as it had this kind of ludicrous like purple interior. And, you know, I'm not I'm just not that guy. I'm not, you know, turning up and it's just like, hey, just so you know, I'm rich. I think a Maybach flies a bit under the radar if you specify it right. So. Yeah. I listen, I, I I knew a guy that, that bought a used Rolls Royce. He just wanted one and he loved it. And um, he didn't, you know, he's got money, obviously, lives in a nice community, but he doesn't really live in a community of everyone just driving the most expensive cars ever. There are definitely some neighborhoods that are like that. And and this is a little bit more open kind of ranch style uh, type of neighborhood. And as much as he absolutely loved that car, he's like, I got rid of it. I was like, why? He's like, I, I just kept getting like shamed for driving it. It's just like, and I, I was getting, you know, kind of anxious and, and didn't and stopped enjoying it because I just, people were just like commenting and, and uh, you know, you drive through LA and, you know, a homeless guy at the intersection will come up to you and start asking you for money and going, you could afford it. You could afford it. Look at your car. And you're just kind of slinking down in your seat going, I just want to drive away. I'm not quite I, sure what to do here. <laughs> I mean, I would like a, like an eighties one or something, but they're, I mean, they, you could, they're like 15 grand or something, but then 15 grand to fix every time anything breaks. But yeah, it's, I'd like a, like a, yeah. Eighties one or something, which, which would be quite cool, but it's not, it's not me. I'm glad it exists. You know, they do some amazing stuff, you know, amazing bespoke stuff. And there was quite a few knocking around at the McLaren party last last night. People driving them, people being driven in them. There's a new Cullinan that's just come out with these kind of weird little eyebrows that it's got. And yeah, it's by the way, that's a great event to take your Rolls Royce to, right? Because everyone is showing up. It's high dollar, yeah. it's glam, and and parking them all up front or valeting them, like that's that's a nice fun experience. That's what you take it for. It, it is, but I still think it's cooler turning up in a truck. <laughs> I I think so. Listen, if I was going to be there, I would have shown up in my truck because that's what I'm driving. Yeah. Uh, all like, right. So let's. I'm uh, so rich. I drive a Ford. That's like real money. Yeah. <laughs> I think the Rock does. The Rock has got several Raptors. He keeps going over to Galpin to buy Raptors and Raptor R. But if you're the Rock and you go to Galpin to buy Raptor R, uh. Jim Farley shows up at the dealer to hand it off to you. So, because, yeah. you know, I bought my truck there. I didn't see Jim Farley hand off the keys to me. So, <laughs> I guess you got to see how afford. Yeah. Yeah. I guess you got to be the rock. Um, all right. So, before we wrap up, just tell us a little bit what's going on over at uh, at Edmonds that we can look forward to now. What's coming? Yeah. Up? Well, we just did a, launched a video today uh, as we record this. Um, so, it's up on our YouTube channel. Uh, Land Cruiser against GX550. Maybe we should talk more about that next week, actually, because that was a really interesting piece. I mean, ostensibly very similar cars, but you know, quite different in in treatment. I mentioned the CRV and the Rav4 and the Sportage, like a hybrid SUV, you know, showdown. Um, and then just a bunch of a bunch of news and stuff on our long term fleet, our Fisco. Still not sure what's going on with that. We've driven the uh, the EV, the G G Wagon EV. There's all stuff about that. So yeah, head to edmunds.com slash news. And I, I heard something like uh, Kia, the uh, the EV9 that you guys really spoke highly of. I think they're doing something like $12,000 cash back or something on that. So we hmm. should- The EV9, yeah. EV9 is a great, I mean, that's our Edmunds top rated. The best, the best. It's a great car. It's- yeah, I mean, we, we've talked about this ad infinitum on the show, and we just, the, you know, the price of EVs, and there was a survey came out this morning, and it's like more people would consider EVs if they were the same price as gas cars. Yeah, great yeah. survey. <laughs> yeah. Who knew? <laughs> yeah. Um, that's well, the challenge. Money, money well spent on that survey. <laughs> yeah. There's the, there's the, that, that's the challenge. And 
you know, it'll it'll sort itself out in the end, but it's going to take a while. Yeah. All right. We're going to wrap things up. Um, Alistair, thanks so much. I appreciate it. And uh, until next time, keep the air in the spare and the bag in the wheel. How about Captain Crunch's Crunch Berries with breakfast? Whoa, Dad, we're on Crunch Island. <gasps> it's Jean Le Foot. <laughs> and he stole our crunch. Quick, the zip line. He's getting away. Throw our last Crunch Berry. No! No one steals my Crunch Berries. I think you mean my Crunch Berries. Choose your own Crunch Venture with Captain Crunch. Some people take the straight path in life. But at Arizona State University, we respect your twists and turns. They make our online students more driven to excel in their professional lives. That's why our personalized suite of services empowers you with innovative resources and staff that sticks with you. Make your next turn with one of our 300-plus programs at ASU, ranked in the top five for best online bachelor's programs. To learn more, visit asuonline.asu.edu. Hey, parents. Greenlight is here to take one big thing off your to-do list, teaching your kids about money. With a Greenlight debit card and money app of their own, kids and teens learn to earn, save, and invest. You can send money instantly, set flexible controls, and get real-time notifications of your kids' money activity. Set up chores and put allowance on autopilot to reward them for their hard work. Then learn about the world of money together. Get one month free when you sign up at greenlight.com slash podcast. Whether you're a morning person or a bedtime procrastinator, everyone deserves a mattress that works for their style. And you'll find the best mattress for you at Ashley. The new Temper Adapt Collection at Ashley brings you one-of-a-kind body-conforming technology, making every sleep tailored to be your best. The collection also features cool-to-the-touch covers and motion absorption to help minimize sleep disruptions from partners, pets, or kids. Shop the all-new Temper Adapt Collection at Ashley in-store or online at ashley.com. Ashley, for the love of home.